Without further ado, I get the pleasure to bring and introduce to the stage a guy who's leading a company that has completely disrupted the sneaker industry. He's a serial entrepreneur and co-founder and CEO of an amazing company that's based out in Detroit, Michigan. Please give a warm welcome to Josh Luber. I was sitting in the back and no one told me that I was coming up here. Sorry for the delay. There was a whole lot of people outside that weren't able to get in. Um, I have some sort of note card here. Um, uh, I'll play a short video first and then we'll get started. Which ones are which? Nikes, Easy's, Jordan's. Enjoy How does the sneaker industry function as a stock market? Only 23 of these have been made, stuff. and you get all this in the box over on StockX. I'm Josh Luber, CEO over at StockX. What are you looking for in terms of sneakers tonight? Nobody pray for me. It's been a day for me. Yeah, yeah. Hey, I remember syrup sandwiches and crime allowances for nissing on them. Welcome to StockX TV. I'm here with Eminem to pick up shoes for the charity auction on StockX. I'm here with Eminem too. <laughs> There's, you know, the ones, the threes, the fours, the elevens. Those are shoes that I remember as a kid being like, those are amazing, those are incredible. I got my Yeezys, got my NMDs, I wore the shit out of these too. StockX and Eminem partnered for a hurricane relief campaign, and we raised almost $450,000. So you gotta get those. You don't have a pair of Jordans, you gotta get those. $52,000. These are via StockX, right? Most important sneaker in shoe wear history. It's crazy to see that something like sneakers can have this type of an effect. We've launched watches, handbags, and streetwear. What if there was a stock market of things? Hold up. What the f is a sneaker stock market? I always find that it's awesome when people clap for videos as opposed to the people that are up here talking, but that's cool. Um, so just a couple housekeeping things. Um, first of all, clearly this is what happens when you say you're giving away free Yeezys. You get a whole lot of people standing room only and, and people waiting outside and drive around in a big green bus saying free Yeezys for, for two days. Um, what we're going to do is um, we're going to do the raffle. Uh, we actually ended up, I don't know if some of you guys heard, so we ended up doing two raffles. We did a raffle for the people that couldn't get in. Uh, and then we'll do the raffle for the people in the room after uh, the talk. I'll speak for about half an hour. We'll do as much Q&A as you guys want to talk about. Um, and then we'll see who, who wins everything. Um, I do a lot of talks like this at different places. And not always do we get a room that, at least from here, looks like a lot of people are, are familiar with StockX and sneakers in general. Just curious, how many people here knew about StockX before they came in here? That's awesome. Okay. So this is, gonna be, this is about the bigger idea, right? And some of you guys might know a little bit about this, but this is about the really, really big idea of StockX, which goes well beyond sneakers. But obviously, it starts there. And so um, I'm going to run through, and particularly the beginning part, a lot of you guys in the audience are going to know exactly what I'm talking about. But think about it when we give this presentation that people have no idea what's going on in the sneaker world, all right? So these are two pairs of the Air Jordan 4. They're both black, they both have some light accents, and the Jordan 4 retails for about $190. But on the secondary market, on sites like eBay and StockX, the shoe on the left resells for about $230. The shoe on the right, $23,000. And of course, these aren't the only two black Jordan 4s. There's this one for $700, and this one for $600, and these three. And there's about 50 different Jordan 4s, and there's 32 different Jordans, and there's a whole lot of other shoes besides Jordans. And the last time we counted, or estimated last year, there were over 11 million pairs of sneakers resold in the United States alone at a value of over $1.6 billion. 
And this is the whole thing. On one hand, just an example of just the incredulous nature of sneakers, the fact that some sell for more than a car. On the other hand, just the basic supply and demand. This is Econ 101 at its most basic. The shoe on the left, there were hundreds of thousands of this shoe released. The shoe on the right, this was a collaboration with M&M, as most of you guys know, and there were only 10 pairs released. So it makes sense that it sells for $20,000. It should probably sell for more. But these same basic economic principles, the same basic supply and demand, has almost no reality in the rest of our e-commerce world. When we're buying and selling anything in the rest of the internet, what we experience as consumers is something more akin to supply and deceive, right? Cars, bikes, toaster ovens, right? It's something more like supply and deceive. And here's some examples, and these are real examples. This is a listing for a cat litter box on Amazon. And I don't have a cat, but $27 seems like a pretty reasonable price. But if you look closely at the list price, $2,159. What? Oh, and by the way, there's only one left of this unbelievable deal on cat litter boxes. Here's another one, dog treats. I don't have a dog, but $8 for dog treats sounds about right. List price, $822. These are real. Back in uh, 2015, I did a TED talk about sneakers, and the theme of that talk was this, right? $20,000 sneakers. Perhaps a better theme for what we're talking about today is something like this, right? Except it's not just Pet Supply, and it's certainly not just Amazon. Here's an example from eBay, and to make it apples to apples, sneakers. These, this is the... Um, the search results for a shoe called the Jordan 12 Wings from the week after it released. And you can see at the top, it says there's 1,223 listings for this shoe, and here's the top four. 25,000, 25,000, 18,000, 15,000. And from the example before, we know that some shoes really do sell for that amount of money. If we were to keep scrolling through the listings, we would see the top 82 listings are all being sold for at least $2,000. But because we track eBay data, we can tell you that the average price of any of the Jordan 12 wings that actually sold was only $932. And in fact, the most that any one pair actually sold for was only $1,600. So there is a huge disconnect between what people are asking for this shoe, $25,000, versus what it's actually worth. So if you're starting to ask the question of where this is going, the question is, how does this Right? And the fundamental economics of the secondary market for sneakers, how is that going to solve all of this? The answer, of course, is this. Right? And we've started to see some of it already. This is a real tweet from literally the week after release from people that have no idea about why we're doing this, but just understand StockX is the exact opposite of everything that's wrong with eBay. You don't have to understand why to start to feel the problems that were associated, and we're starting to build a little bit on the bigger idea here. But it's worthwhile, before we go too deep in that, to look at the history. All right? I get this question asked a lot, which is, how did StockX start in the background? The short answer is that prior to this, I had started a company called Campless. Campless was a price guide. It was like the Kelly Blue Book for sneakers. All right? And so we had this idea that if you knew the value of sneakers, if you had a price guide, then you could create sneaker portfolios. This idea of looking at someone's sneaker collection the same way you look at a stock portfolio and just track its value over time. And then the logic in the data was, well, if you understood asset pricing, if you understood portfolio pricing, then perhaps you could create an actual stock market for sneakers. And that was the idea. It was a very pie in the sky idea. I'm not a developer. There's no way I could have built that. But it was just kind of what we thought made sense with the data. And we talked to everybody in the sneaker industry, Nike, eBay, Foot Locker, you name it, and there was never really a good fit for what to do with this little sneaker data company and this idea. And then there's a whole long, crazy story that leads to me meeting Dan Gilbert. And the short of it is that Dan had the exact same idea independently to create a stock market for sneakers. Of course, the difference between kind of billionaires and the rest of us is that here I was building from the ground up, saying, you know, this will work so perfect for sneakers, this really fit. And Dan sort of topped down and said, no, 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 this should be how the whole world works, right? This should be the future of all e-commerce. And I was like, fuck yeah, I'm on board with that. Like, let's go build that. 
And so it wasn't just Dan and I, or, or we um, actually have a third co-founder who doesn't get uh, nearly as much uh, uh, credit or notoriety, and he's in the room today, a guy named Greg Schwartz, and this is a picture of Greg drinking out of a pineapple that he doesn't like me to show. Um, but the three of us created StockX and, and operate as, uh, as co-founders. He's all the way in the back over there. Now everyone turns and looks and, yeah, Donnie, thank you. Um, and we are fortunate to have a lot of really um, prominent investors, including Eminem and Mark Wahlberg and Drake um, and a lot of others. But the question is, and, and what we're here and what I'd like to, to talk about for a minute, right, is what is StockX? What does it really mean to be a stock market of things, right? We are not a stock market in the way that maybe you traditionally think about it. It's not about investments, although it could be, right? But we are a marketplace. We are a marketplace like eBay our job is to connect buyers and sellers for the specific reason of allowing them to buy or sell products. But the method of how we connect buyers and sellers is the exact same way that the world stock markets work. And I'm sure a lot of you understand that already, but to talk about it a little bit more, the method by how that works is what's called a live bid-ask market. So buyers are placing bids, how much they're willing to pay for something, and sellers are placing asks, how much you're willing to sell it for. And what you end up with is a market price, a market price where both sides, buyers and sellers, can transact immediately. That forms, and we're gonna get a little bit, I don't know, dense for a minute. We talk about um, the nuances of this. Um, but there's three fundamental tenets of what it means to be a stock market, all right? Anonymous, transparent, and authentic. These, this is the fundamental difference between every other form of commerce. And I'm going to run through each of these quickly, and then we'll get back to some of the other stuff. Let's start with the easy one, all right? Authenticity. If you were a 15-year-old kid and you could care less what it means to be a stock market or bids or asks or any of this, you know you're never going to get a fake pair of Yeezys. And that alone is huge, huge value. But for us, that is just the ante to play. Right? That facilitates the whole rest of the market. Because if you had any doubt at all that the shoe that you were gonna get is real, it would change your entire perception of value. Think about that, if you were buying a share of Apple stock in the New York Stock Exchange, and you thought that what they sent you might not be real, or that you might not be buying an actual share of Apple stock, the whole model starts to fall apart. So for us, that builds the larger part. I'm gonna stop for a second and recap what we've talked about but I'm gonna use a video, and probably a lot of you guys have seen this before, but it's worthwhile seeing it with a slightly different context as we're talking about what it means to be a stock market. So, you wanna buy a pair of black C-Man 3s, huh? A real pair. And you want the best price? Where do you even start? Here's a thousand auction listings. Take two energy drinks and call me in the morning. How do I even know if the shoe is real? What's a fair price for it? And if I have a problem, is the seller gonna even take care of me? Oh, yeah. A sneaker is a commodity. It should be dead simple to buy a dead stock pair. Welcome to Stock X, an actual stock market for sneakers. It's actually a stock market of things. At Stock X, a transaction occurs when a bid and then ask me. A buyer wants to buy a size 10 black cement. He submits a bid, the price he's willing to pay. Now the entire world knows there's a legit offer because it's tied to his PayPal account. He can go about his day in confidence knowing that if someone is selling for 550, he'll cop. Is that a fing daiquiri? Yeah, bro. A seller has a size 10 black cement. She can place an ask or a listing for sale. If she sees someone that has placed a bid for 550, she can sell it immediately. With two clicks, done deal. Am I the only one not drinking a beach drink? But how do I know if these are real? Hassan, come on, really? What? Every pair of sneakers sold on Stock X passes through our trading floor. With dudes who look like James Harden make sure you never get scammed ever again. Now that's a legit check. The only thing more legit would be if dudes who look like Wale come in and do the voiceovers. Yeah, now no one claps after I say it the first time. That's fine, though. Yeah. 
So um, that was obviously Wale doing the voiceover. Um, the guy with the red beard is a, a famous sneaker YouTube guy. Um, the guy who looks like James Harden is Sadell, who's sitting over there without his James Harden beard over there. Um, look, this has been a phenomenal video for us. This has over seven and a half million views. We created this a few months after we launched. And it does a great job of talking a little bit about the, the what and what we do, and you can get authentic sneakers. It doesn't talk at all about the why and the value and the bigger idea. And so we'll go through the, the next two tenets and talk a little bit about that. And starting with anonymity, okay? So everything on StockX is anonymous. Just like if you buy a, a share of Apple stock in the New York Stock Exchange, there's an actual seller on the other end of that specific trade who is selling you that specific share but you don't know who that is and you don't care. All you care about is the price that you paid for it. Right? And that same way, everything on StockX is anonymous. There's so much time and effort and, and just pain wasted in trying to figure out who the seller is on eBay or Amazon, who are they, where are they located, how many reviews do they have, how many sales they have. All of that is irrelevant if we're the ones that authenticate the shoes. So in that way, it makes it a more efficient market by having it completely anonymous. And it's also completely different from most other marketplaces and how they exist, except the actual stock market. And all of that leads to transparency. All of that leads to the fact that the stock markets have been the most efficient form of commerce for hundreds of years. And it's never been applied to consumer goods. That's what we're doing here. We're taking all that transparency and efficiency and applying it to consumer goods. The best way to understand the transparency that happens is to take a look at a product page on StockX. So this is the product page for the Jordan 12 Wings, which is the same shoe that we saw earlier from the eBay example. And if you remember from the eBay example, there were 1,223 eBay listings for this shoe. Well, if you go buy a share of Apple stock, there's not 1,200 people saying, buy my Apple stock, buy my Apple stock. There's one ticker symbol for Apple. And everything happens at that one place. Every bid and every ask happens at that one place. And so for that same reason, there's one product page for the Jordan 12 wings on StockX. And everything happens right there. That's what creates the efficiencies. And there's three numbers at the top. So not only can you see what people are selling it for, but you can see the last sale that actually happened was $800. Right? This says last sale here for, for people in the back. Compare that to the eBay example, where you literally would have had to go through 82 listings to get even remotely close to what this shoe is actually selling for. In the middle, it says lowest ask, so $849. So you can buy this shoe right now for $849. There's one single place to buy this. Compare that to eBay, where you would have had to figure out through 1,200 listings, who should I buy from? Which one is real? Who's got the lowest price? And all of that. Again, the way the stock market works, you go there, there's one price for Apple stock. And then the last part, and this is the whole thing, right? This is the truly, truly, for lack of a less cliche way to say it, the revolutionary part of this, it says highest bid, $750. You can sell this right now for $750. Someone has placed a bid tied to their PayPal or their credit card, and you can sell it by just clicking that sell button. This button right here is the part that is different from every, this generally doesn't exist except any other form of commerce except for the actual stock market. So internally, we talk about something called sell now. This concept of sell now doesn't exist in the rest of your e-commerce life, right? In every other form of commerce, the buyer has the choice, right? The seller lists something for sale and says, I'm selling this widget for $100. Does anyone want to buy it? And all the buyers can choose. I will either buy it or I will not buy it. But in the stock market, A seller doesn't go and try to list a share of Apple stock and hope someone comes and buys it. No, you go to the market, there's a market price, and you can sell it immediately for that price. And that's the idea here. That's the thing that is really different. But honestly, this is just the beginning, right? This is just the sort of foundational layer of what it means to operate as a stock market. The bigger idea gets to be, frankly, a lot, a lot more exciting. So um, this, is, this is the reaction from people, right? The transparency, the thoughtful data, the ease of use factor is through the roof. That's the key. You don't have to understand why, right? But when you think about how much easier it is to sell something this way versus anywhere else, this is the reaction that you get. The more emotional reaction is, stock export a tear to my eye. And I mean, isn't that all we ever want to do is just make dudes cry, right? So, but what it's led to is, 
I mean, the amount of press that we've had and can't even fit all on one page is because sneakers and Dan Gilbert and Eminem and all that is sexy and, and draws people in. But the bigger idea about what we're doing, that's the reason why we've gotten so much coverage. That's the reason why we're standing up here and talking about this today. And it's led to a, a lot of other stuff. And if you guys follow Stock X, you've probably seen a lot of it. All sorts of different brand partnerships we've done with people. Um, we do a TV show that's kind of like Mad Money for Sneakers, StockX TV. We have live segments with SportsCenter and Cheddar. We raised almost $450,000 for hurricane relief um, last year through 17 sneakers. That's it, almost $450,000. Um, we did this. These are the reissue of the Encore 4. There is only 23 pairs. Well, there's 23, but number 23 took a pair for himself. Right now, there's a pair selling for over $75,000. That's me selling them on mine. <laughs> Is it? Yeah. I appreciate it. All right, thanks, man. All right. Go to StockX.com and hit me up on Match.com. That was, that was not at all scripted. Um, that was him just running with it. How crazy is that, right? This is, this is us on Eminem's Instagram page. This is Eminem's Instagram page that they put up about us doing this. Eminem doesn't do anything. It's not just because it's Detroit or because it's sneakers. It's because they were really interested in being involved in the bigger idea. And yeah, this Instagram post led to this because the internet remains undefeated. But I will take that every single time because what the fuck? I got to interview Eminem. That shit's crazy, right? But look, all this, none of this, none of this matters if we don't actually sell anything, if the business doesn't actually work and people buy and sell anything. But we sell a lot of things. So right now, we do just close to $2 million a day in sales. Last month, we had over 5 million users. Right now, the team it's over 130 full-time people in Detroit and Arizona, right? And we have 50 open job racks. In fact, that's the only reason I'm here. If anyone was here at three o'clock, I said the same thing then. We're just recruiting. We're hiring across the board. Tell your friends and tell his friends. Every level across the board, from entry level through C-level positions, we're hiring because we're growing that fast and it's fun. Because the idea is this, right? There's many other places that you can buy a pair of sneakers and, and Yes, we do compete with some of those people if someone wants to buy a, a pair of shoes, but this is the category that we think about ourselves in, right? eBay is the largest marketplace for auctions, and Amazon is the largest marketplace for storefronts, and we want to be the largest marketplace for stock market form of commerce. So far, we have four categories. Sneakers, watches, handbags, and streetwear. And if we were any other business with any other smaller goal, there is no way that we would have gone into watches and handbags already at this point. Two completely different categories, two completely different customers, right? But for us, it's always been about the model, about the bigger idea. It's why it's called StockX and not SneakerX. And, and the way that these four industries operate is almost identical, right? So think about these brands, right? Nike, Rolex, Louis Vuitton, Supreme exact same strategy for every one of them of having very limited exclusive products that are very hard to get at retail that lead to retail sellouts that lead to secondary markets that lead to fragmentation of secondary markets because the brands aren't involved in it that leads to collectors it leads to authenticity issues i mean it is identical down the board and for us being about the model these are the products that work best right but it's not only these products in fact theoretically StockX works for almost anything Right? It's really around the idea of scarcity. And when we think about those brands, we really understand what scarcity means. But the flip side of that, and we think about expanding beyond those hyper, hyper rare brands, is what we think about is finite supply. Right? Finite supply is the same as scarcity. What that means is, so for example, StockX doesn't work for a one of one. A totally unique item like a work of art or a house, right? there's no market for a one of one. And there's no market for something that has infinite supply. So think like plastic water bottles or, or toilet paper, right? There, there's no market for that because you have infinite supply. But anything that has finite supply, which is think about almost any consumer good that you can think of, the model theoretically works really well for that, right? 
because the model relies on that bid-ask model. And the bids, right? Think about back, there was a bid for $750 for that shoe that was tied to someone's PayPal or their credit card. That is true consumer demand, right? A stock market is a variable pricing model that moves real time with the market. And theoretically, variable pricing should be the way that everything should be priced. But brands, companies, stores, they won't do it because consumer demand is an unknown, so it's a really risky proposition. The only time we see this at all a little bit, right, is in airline pricing. But in airline pricing, we're essentially um, locked in. We don't have a choice because it's the day before a flight, right? So the key here is consumer demand. StockX is a big data company. And what's a stock market if not a huge data company? But the holy grail of the data is consumer demand. And that's what the model does. That's what bids do, right? And that's what enables this. And so we think about the business, right? It started as a data business, and that's really the core. And we've become a better resale model. It just is. For certain products, it is a better model for resale. But the idea, the bigger idea, is to start moving into retail, to start blurring the line between what is retail and what is resale. That's what a stock market is. Think about it. An IPO of Facebook stock happens. The stock is released into the market, and that same market continues to trade it, right? That's the idea. The best example that we already have of this is ticketing, right, from a consumer standpoint. Think about 10 years ago. This is 10 years ago. Leagues and teams are arresting ticket scalpers outside of stadiums. They're shutting down ticket uh, uh, websites. Today, today, StubHub is the official resale marketplace of Major League Baseball. And not only that, Right? But StubHub has primary ticket deals with the Sixers and the Yankees and a few other teams. So if you are a Sixers season ticket holder, your tickets are delivered to you via StubHub. So if you want to resell a few, you're already on StubHub. Right? That blurring the line between retail and resell, it's starting to happen in other places. And the idea for StockX is to apply that to all these other products. And we've actually already done one of these. We've actually done a few. Right? The biggest IPO of a consumer good that we did was in uh, last January. And we did one with Nike, and some of you guys may remember this, around LeBron James' first retro sneaker. So this was the first time that Nike ever brought back LeBron's first shoe called the Air Zoom Generation. And they sold it on StockX first before it went to any other retail channel. And it came in this massive package that was a sneaker box that was made out of wood from the Cavaliers championship court, right? And included an actual Cavs championship ring that a lot of times I pass this around when it's like high schools, and that door's open in the back. I feel like this would have walked out, so we'll have this later walking around. But it included box, an actual Cavs championship ring, the shoes, right? This ended up, you know, there's the ring. It ended up on, on Sports Center. This was homepage of the New York Times. This was homepage of the New York Times, and it wasn't because of the ring in the box. It was because it was a really big deal about Nike going direct to the secondary market, just like it was a really big deal when Major League Baseball and StubHub created this deal six years ago. And here's the thing. There were 46 of these packages. They sold for an average of $6,000 a piece. We gave half the money to charity. But here's the thing, and this is the whole thing. There were seven of those people who bought that IPO through us that wanted to resell that package after they bought it from us. And we let them resell it without ever taking possession. So we literally created day trading in consumer goods. This is like oil futures and frozen pork bellies and like true commodities trading. And yes, this was the best picture I could find for commodities trading. <laughs> right? But that's the bigger idea, right? Like, and we don't do that at scale yet, but we will. I mean, we absolutely will. We probably have to go register with the CFTC and become a commodities exchange, but that's a bigger idea of basing everything on the way the stock market works, right? So the way the business grows is it's a data, it's a data play, it's a better market for resale, you blur into retail, and then you literally put an investment layer on top of the whole thing. So when you look at our competitor set, it starts like this, where we're a data company, but it's secondary markets against eBay, and by the way, we passed eBay in same shoe sales like 18 months ago. They're not even a competitor anymore for the products that we carry. And then you start competing with retail. And by the way, there couldn't be a better time in the history of the world to be disrupting retail. And then you're literally competing against the New York Stock Exchange and, and other 
commodities exchanges as an alternate investment. And so then our homepage, which looks like this, and at the bottom, which I'll move up here, there's an actual stock ticker and, and indices. And today, this is purely for brand and it's fun, but maybe it doesn't have to be, right? The U.S. sneaker market is 1.6 billion, maybe globally it's six or seven billion. That's a drop in the bucket to the global investment community, All right? That doesn't matter. But if you had some fraction of the global e-commerce community, the five trillion dollar e-commerce market, well, all of a sudden you might actually have indices like the Jordan Index and the Easy Index and investing in that instead of the S&P 500, right? I don't know. That's what we're working on. That's StockX. So. Thanks. This is my daughter. She does all Q&A with me. So she and I will do Q&A for a little bit. I'm going to take a sip of water. Uh, we'll, yeah, we'll switch the mics. Anybody got questions? Hi, um, I'm level two. I'm not anything special, but eight sales on StockX since October, so yeah. Um, Everyone needs to give their StockX stats before you're talking. Yeah. <laughs> Return of the Jedi, little token. Um, is eBay, I, I know I saw you post different companies, is eBay the only API that y'all have or that y'all look into in terms of sales? So what he was asking is, is eBay the only API that we looked in in terms of sales? In the beginning, um, that's what Campless was, right? When we started Campless in early 2012, it was, um, eBay was still the largest sneaker marketplace, and so we were bringing in all eBay sales to create that price guide. Today, we don't actually bring in anywhere from anywhere else because we are the largest marketplace, so the other data it becomes almost ir irrelevant. But in the beginning, it was all eBay. Two questions. Uh, first, do you guys uh, ever um, buy any of the goods yourself if it drops below a certain price since you have all the pricing for it and then resell it on your platform? That's the first question. The second one is, uh, you talked about the four categories that you're in, what's next? So um, first question with regard to buying products ourselves. Um, we could, um, we don't, primarily because we don't need to. Um, there's so much liquidity that happens in the market, particularly for sneakers and for streetwear, that it's, um, it's almost not worth us sort of disrupting the market and, and sticking our nose in the middle of it. Um, you know, our business is a marketplace. Um, but the, um, uh, to the second question in terms of what's next, you know, it's interesting. We don't have a, like, this is absolutely the, the fifth category of where we're going to. But there's two things. So in streetwear, we only have two brands right now, which is Supreme and Kith. So we're absolutely adding uh, Bape, and then Palace, and then Fear of God in that order. And you guys will probably all see that within the next six to eight weeks um, between all three of them. And so that's the, the easiest way to grow is you add other products within the same categories. There's a lot of other categories that might make sense for next. We've looked at, for example, um, like art prints. Um, we've also looked at like collectible toys like uh, Bear Bricks and Cause and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, there, there's no like definitive of what's that. I mean, the focus of this year for us is really around growing these categories and then growing internationally and creating a more presence on the ground internationally. So, but I also think it'll be very opportunistic for any of these categories for us to launch them. We need to have somebody that really knows that market, right? Like when we want to la launch watches, right? Like I wear a six dollar shoelace. Like I was not going to be the watch guy out there and doing that, right? But we found people that were experts in that category and, and to come in and do that. So that becomes one of the bottlenecks to launching other categories is finding true experts to help us build that on the authentication side and on the on the product side. So. All right. I had a question about um, retail stores. Are you guys going to open up any stores? presence with uh, like sneaker cons. Do you guys want to come out there and help the kids learn how to authenticate their own shoes so the deal go a little bit smoother? So the question was around uh, sneaker con and, and having a presence out there in, in sneaker con. Maybe. I mean, it's a completely different business, right? You know, sneaker con is, a, is, a, um, is essentially a trade show for, for sneakers out there. And they actually have, um, you know, different legit checks booths and, and things like that. So we've been involved in some of the local ones. There's, there's one in Michigan called Michigan Sneaker Exchange that we've done because we know those guys. 
Um, you know, like our core business is, is an online marketplace, and we've slowly started to do things in the community at events um, beyond just, you know, just me speaking. And so I, I think it's an open question of like, what is the right way to engage with SneakerCon? What is the right way to engage with, with other parts of the ecosystem? Because we have no plans to create competing events like that. So, you know, there, there's probably a way to, to work with them. So, and Ashita, a, a question there? Um, I'm wondering if, with a brand like yours and the growth that you have, if you've thought about um, unique products designed through you with designers and signature products that you release a very limited amount and then sell through StockX. 100%, right? That, that is the sort of 1B to um, IPOs being 1A. So when we think about IPOs and, and the retail strategy here, it's to work with brands to release products through us the way they've done with LeBron's first shoe. But a corollary to that is to just to create our own products through them or, and you know, it, with Nike, right? We're not going to create our own sneakers, but maybe you work with a brand to create a collab. On the other hand, now that we're in streetwear and expanding into other streetwear categories, Maybe we create uh, capsule collections with StockX merch with other brands because you know they're easier to work with and easier to produce. It's a whole lot easier to produce a T-shirt than it is to produce a, a pair of sneakers. So 100%, like as we go there, the opportunity to create IPOs, whether through this existing product of the brands that already have or with us, like absolutely. Yep. Hey, how you doing? Uh, I'm Leslie Winston. Uh, I had a question about, um, I know around the U.S. there are a lot of uh, sort of mom and pop uh, consignment and uh, buy, sell, trade stores um, that sort of consist of that local uh, sneaker economy. Um, how can you sort of capture that data or sort of involve them in uh, sort of a, a larger scale uh, trading? Yep. So one of the really phenomenal things about being an anonymous marketplace is that all those guys can sell through us. And frankly, a lot of them do, right? And a lot of the big consignment shops sell through us. And a lot of, you know, and it's OK, right, that the end buyer doesn't know who it's coming from, again, because they care about the price and the authenticity. But it's a really big benefit for stores, particularly local consignment shops, right? Let's say that they have excess inventory on a certain product. Well, they don't want to discount in store on their website because they want to sell for as much as they can, but maybe they want to move some excess inventory through us. So we see that all the time. Some of them have their inventory integrated directly with us. Some of them, you know, sell through us. But, you know, ultimately, like, that's the benefit of being the, the marketplace up here. Consignment shops will always have their place in the ecosystem, right? There's always that seller that says, you know, here, you know, take my shoes. I don't want to have anything to do with this. You sell it. And that's great. And maybe one day we do that as well. Maybe one day we actually facilitate consignment. But in the meantime, it becomes a pretty easy way for those guys to engage with us that would have really been hard in eBay or other marketplaces where you have to create that brand on there. All of a sudden, it's like, well, why is this shop selling this for $100 on this site and $150 on this site? So there's a lot of value in the anonymity. Hey, Josh. Um, I was just wondering, um, as you uh, scale, are you worried that the percentage of um, like merchandise that you get that you've got to then reject and send back is going to grow as like more people get onto the site? And if so, like, how are you thinking about that? Yeah, so the question is, is the amount of shoes and product that we reject will grow? What's actually happened is it's gone the other way, at least so far. So today, we see about 2% of the products that we get that we reject as fake. When we opened the doors in February of 2016, that first month, it was like 15, 18%. We were like, holy shit, this is never gonna work, right? What was happening in the beginning was everyone was testing us and everybody was trying to figure out if one, if we were actually gonna reject it and what they could get through. Today, most people, most of the fakes that we see are people that they genuinely don't know they have a fake, right? We're the ones that has to be the bearer of bad news. Because if you know that we authenticate, right, if you know that we're checking, like, you're smarter to go sell it somewhere else. Go sell it on eBay, right? You're stupid to send it. I mean, there's some stupid people, right? But for the most part, like, you're, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't choose to send it through us 
because there's still all those other places that, um, that don't. And so um, until that becomes just kind of like the standard across the board, as long as there's that arbitrage and people can, can sell it elsewhere, it's great. It actually ends up lowering it if people know that that's what we do. So one more. All right, so we're going to do one more question. And then I don't know if I'm doing the raffle or someone else is going to come up here and do the raffle. And OK. Well, there we go. Um, do you have any plans to implement other aspects of the stock market, say mutual funds, options trading, any of that other fun stuff? You guys all laugh, but 100%, right? 100%. Now, when and how we get there, you know, it's not the, the direct line, right? That is not the priority tomorrow to be able to do that. Again, fundamentally, we are a marketplace. We are about connecting buyers and sellers. But just like we've talked about through IPOs, through indices, through enabling day trading, all of those more complicated financial transactions are absolutely possible. And whether it's buying fractional shares of sneakers, you know, all of that. So that, that absolutely is the bigger idea. It's just a question of how and when you get there and with what products and how. You know, if you think about the fundamental difference between commodities trading here versus, say, oil futures, right? Those barrels of oil that people are trading, they actually do exist somewhere. They sit in a warehouse that people can trade. The difference is no one ever takes possession of them, right? You could, you absolutely could choose to close out that contract and have 100 barrels of oil delivered to your house. Nobody does that, but you could. The difference for us is that ultimately we need to be enable that end of the transaction where someone says, yeah, I bought and sold that easy and I'm ready to take possession of it. And that's really the only difference, right? But it still has to sit, that physical product sit somewhere just like that physical barrels of oil sit somewhere as well. And so those are just the example of, you know, you got to tweak what that looks like, but all of those, those um, processes and, and systems, exact same way, so, okay. All right, I think I'm getting the notification that we're going to do the raffle. So thank you all for um, listening through me for the chance to win a pair of Yeezys.